and it shall come to pass, in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. We should first consider to whom this verse is addressed. The context is unchanged since the first verse. It is addressed to God's elect, the Israel of God and mystical body of Christ, the members of which have passed through a divinely appointed ordeal of some sort, an ordeal that the King James states as sorrow and fear and hard bondage. And how strange to modern Christian thinking that believers should go through any divinely appointed trouble. It is as if we have forgotten that promise of Scripture that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We are appointed tribulation, but we are also promised that the tribulation shall pass. And so, this prophecy states that it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow. And this is not the sorrow of daily life that is common to men. We are not promised relief from that, at least not until we exit this world. We are destined for peace, even while we exist in this world, a real, tangible peace that we may feel within our soul, a peace that is enduring. It is trouble that is of a temporal nature, temporal both in respect to the natural troubles of this world, but also temporal in respect to those divinely appointed for which God afterwards brings us into rest and peace, the peace of Christ. And it shall come to pass in that day. The Hebrew word translated and it shall come to pass is haya, which means to be or was, as meaning to simply be or exist. And this is the chief word behind was and were in the King James Version. And we find it occurring twice in the following verse. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And it is followed by the Hebrew word yom, meaning day. And so the plainest English rendering would be, It will be in that day. But this is certainly not a literal 24-hour day. Rather, this is a mystical day, a day foretold in the prophets, a day even typified in one of the Levitical feast days. In fact, this recurring reference in prophecy to the day of the Lord always refers to one of the seven Levitical feast days. And this is because they represent the revelation of Jesus Christ in some way upon humanity and upon the man. And this particular day is the day that the Lord shall give thee rest. The Lord is the Hebrew word Jehovah and is a reference to Christ, who is the source and substance of God's rest. This word translated rest is a common Hebrew word meaning simply to sit down, to leave, to settle with, or to give rest. And this is the same word used in verse 1 above, stating that God will set them in their own land. And therefore, again, the subject has not changed since the very first verse. It is speaking of the mystical principle of sanctification, and apparently the more specific principle of crisis sanctification. That was the theme of much holiness teaching during the 18th and 19th centuries of church history. An understanding of Isaiah's 14th chapter will help us in respect to that time of trouble destined for those being sanctified, who upon a true repentance as a work of God's Spirit thereupon undergo a spiritual work of plowing of their soil, their Adama, to make it suitable for the planting of seed, and even exposing things that might never have seen the light of day. And after this turmoil, there is another necessary work of the Spirit, which is to settle the soul into an established disposition in Christ. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. In other words, the repentant soul must be comforted and restored to peace established in a new disposition in respect to Christ, and only now can the word of God be productive in the heart. We are settled, but in respect to what? Isaiah's prophecy cites three conditions from which we will be settled, the first being sorrow. This Hebrew word that is translated sorrow occurs just four times in scripture, but in widely different ways. In its first occurrence, it is translated the same. 
1 Chronicles 4, 9. And his mother called his name Jabez, because I bear him with sorrow. However, there is nothing definite in the meaning of the name Jabez. The lexicon qualifies itself by saying that it probably means sorrow, apparently from the context in 1 Chronicles 4, 9, which is childbirth, and considering the curse upon Eve, that in sorrow she would bring forth children. However, that assumption does not seem to bear out in the remaining two occurrences of the word, the next being Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Certainly a meaning of sorrow would be a poor fit to the context of this verse. The final occurrence of this word is in Isaiah 48, where we read, Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, My idol hath done it. This word either does not mean sorrow, or else it is capable of radically different meanings. And when we look to the lexicon, it observes that the word is a variation of the preceding Strong's word, etseb, painful toil, grievous labor, or sorrow, particularly in light of its first occurrence, which was the curse upon womanhood. Genesis 3.16, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And the second occurrence of this word is not until the book of Psalms, where we read, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. The context of Psalm 127 is striving or laboring after a matter. And in fact, we find it is translated this very way in the next occurrence, in Proverbs 5. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And the remaining occurrences of the word are as follows. The likely connotation of the word appears to be that of striving, toil, or labor. For instance, even when the King James translates it in sorrow in respect to childbearing, well, it could just as easily be rendered in toil or in labor, thou shalt bring forth children. Or when it is translated grievous, its placement in Proverbs 15.1 suggests it means the opposite of soft or gentle, in other words, hard or given to struggle. And so, when we see the word translated in Isaiah 48.5, lest thou should say, my idol has done them, well, that phrase might better be rendered, lest you should say my own struggle or my own toil has done it. It would seem the stronger rendering of Isaiah 14.3 would be when the Lord settles you from your labor or from your striving. The second reference we are settled from is translated from thy fear. And the lexicon indicates the word connotes commotion, restlessness, or disquiet. And so the New American Standard seems to come closer to the meaning when, they, when it translates the word turmoil. The word is first used in the book of Job, where it is usually translated trouble. Clearly the word does not mean wrath, even if it might imply that. The more direct meaning is something tempestuous, troublesome, or raging. And so we gather a rendering of this phrase in Isaiah 14.3 as being, when the Lord settles you from your striving and from your turmoil. When prophecy refers to that day, it is speaking a metaphor. It refers to the prophetic day of the Lord, which although having a variety of meanings and fulfillments, stands for one common principle, the mystical day of the Lord, which is God revealing Christ to the man, whether in spirit, whether in soul, or whether in body. Again, this has manifold fulfillment, typified in the various Levitical feast days. And the allusion here in Isaiah 14.3 seems to most clearly relate to the mystical day of atonement, described as follows. We understand that there is a time of weeping in the spirit that is not to be prevented or rejected. And James counsels us, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Powerless religion tends not to discern this work of the Holy Spirit. The church is counseled by Paul to rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. And David prophesies by the Holy Spirit, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth, and girded me with gladness. Painful is the irony that those who refuse the Spirit his time for the wearing of sackcloth actually prevent the true joy of the Holy Spirit that comes through the revelation of the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. God will bring each of us the fulfillment at that great feast day known as the Day of Atonement. This time to afflict the soul occurs when God draws near to us in judgment. But it comes with a hope, a hope of rejoicing, a hope realized through submission to this process. Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And there is a time for the soul to be distressed, that it might be released from sin's bondage. And so, the gospel does not follow the world by telling us to put on a happy face when our soul is laid low. It is laid low because of the Spirit's processes. We submit to the processes of God's Spirit. We wait upon God for the relief, for He is bringing us out from an authority. And so moving along to the third condition, from which God shall give us rest, we find it translated, and from the hard bondage. And the Hebrew word translated hard appears to mean just that, at least in the sense of harshness. Example of its use would be as follows. It does not mean hard in the sense of a hard material, but rather hard in terms of something difficult or something harsh. And the Hebrew word bondage, Abu Da, first occurs in reference to the service that Jacob gave to Laban in exchange for his wives. It also refers to the service borne by Israel when enslaved in Egypt. A more precise rendering would be just as is stated by the New American Standard, hard service. And we continue. And from the bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. We do find a variety of types in the Old Testament for Israel having hard service such as the wanderings of the patriarchs. When Jacob completed his servitude to Laban, well, he even went through an ordeal with God, signified by his struggle with the angel, after which he was told, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. In fact, the same Hebrew word translated bondage is used repeatedly in the Exodus account. However, relating Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 14, to the bondage in Egypt appears contradicted by the very next verse, which indicates it is the king of Babylon that is the oppressor. We find that even after entering Canaan, Israel was placed under tribute to various powers, whether foreign or domestic, due to their wanderings away from God, in which case they would return to a state of bondage. And yet there came a day of deliverance, a day of deliverance for some, although it was available to all. And Isaiah's 14th chapter alludes to that day of mercy that shall come upon the saints of God, provided that they open the door when Christ comes to knock. <laughs> 